I must say the Vaibhav actually gave a lot of highlights uh, about how the technology, super apps, and he covered so many things. In fact, the first thing we do in the morning, uh, all the journalists these days when we wake up is we go to Google, not just for the search engine, but the trends that's happening in the news. That's how the Google has changed the world and we try to compete whether to Google is dominating with us actually. So that was really interesting on my boss part to share all this information. But uh, moving ahead, I think this is the uh, very interesting uh, topic that we have chose, the speed of innovation is what all the BFSI companies are talking about and you can see the, you know, the best minds that I have with me here. So I will try my best to get the best insight. So I have a couple of common and few specific questions. And uh, since we are talking about the dealing with the speed of innovation, my first question is to all the panelists here, how are you dealing with the speed of innovation and how do you ensure your innovation has updated? and keeping pace with the evolution. And uh, let me start with you, Anand, first. Thank you, Amul. Uh, thanks for having me and inviting me uh, for this session. I'll represent SBI General, where I'm working now, and also SBI Life, where I was uh, working uh, uh, a year back for almost 17, 18 years, taking care of, uh, in the last uh, four to five years, looking after IT operations and international business. Um, as you all know, we are a subsidy of State Bank. And State Bank of India, all of you are aware, is uh, going leaps and bounds in terms of digital uh, advancement. At one point of time, when I joined SBI Life in 2003, 2004, people said that probably SBI would never be so much advanced as far as technology is concerned. And today, as uh, uh, Mr. Gupta just mentioned, what kind of advancement you have done and what kind of uh, YONO applications and all they have done, I think it's far, far advanced. So obviously, we as subsidy have to keep pace with these, uh, uh, the parent and the way they are advancing on the digital uh, landscape. For SBI Life in general, I think what we did uh, very early uh, as back as 2017 was, uh, we looked at innovation and we defined innovation initially in the organization. Because inno innovation is a word which is most, um, how should I say, wrongly used or misinterpreted or used the way it suits everybody. So we thought even an organization like us, we should first define what is innovation. So we said it's a process. It's a process to change the domains or the structure or the products or the service delivery. And why do I say it's a process? Because we realize that the moment an organization comes up with an innovation, there is somebody who copies you with a value addition maybe 30 days down the line. So it's a continuous process. How do you go with that process? So whatever I'm now going to tell you is basically based on this definition of you know, what uh, we have defined in the organization. In both the organizations, what we did was we set up something called incubation hubs within the organization. I think we were the first of its kind at the BFSI, especially the insurance industry, where in-house we have a thing called DigiLab. And a DigiLab is something where we encourage uh, ideations of innovation because I think that is something very important for an organization and we strongly believe that if the organization does not promote innovative ideas it's very difficult to come out with innovation Absolutely. okay so both places we have something called uh, DG lab where we allow ideation once the ideation is done we allow evaluation of various technologies whether earlier used in insurance or not used in insurance once we understand that there is a technology which can be used, we then market it to the users, which could be either marketing department or operations or any other uh, uh, unit in the organization, get a champion from them and we start testing it. And once we test it, we realize that there is some value addition that you can do, something different that you can come out with, with no other company uh, in your sector has done it. We come with a pro you know, prototype, prototype is tested and it is rolled out. An entire journey for a DG lab is maximum 90 days, okay. three months. Okay. So this is the process that we do. And in this process, uh, we have also defined certain metrics that that particular innovation has to meet once it is actually implemented. So this is the process uh, thing that uh, both SBI Life and SBI General, we follow very, very, then whatever you have seen, Yes. Uh, innovations happening in both these companies are actually coming out of this uh, in, uh, you know, innovation hub or the DG lab that we have. Right. 
Sure, Anand. I think that was uh, quite interesting to know what's happening at SBI Life and SBI General. Let me move my focus to a bank, and uh, Saurav is beside me. Saurav, uh, let me give, uh, uh, let me learn from you in terms of your innovation strategy at IDBI Bank. How do you look at it, and how's evolution? Okay, so uh, before I go into the uh, uh, the innovation at our bank, I'll just say that, like mentioned before, that innovation is uh, quite a deceptive word, right? So it can be used whenever in, in a different connotation. So uh, uh, banks basically uh, are the pillars of trust and uh, uh, integrating for the, I'm talking in context of the fintechs, right? So uh, if you look at the banks, they have been quite traditional in nature for quite long some time, right? And then when fintechs came in uh, about three, four years back in a big way, uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, within quotes, innovations coming in, right? And there has been, uh, the regulator has been quite, uh, uh, how do I say, it's pretty, uh, they have been quite uh, uh, magnanimous in giving them a leeway, but at the same time, when they saw that innovations were getting out of hand, we recently saw that some of the regulations came out in which the NBFCs uh, were doing something which was not in line, and they put it down, right? So uh, from an innovation perspective, uh, what we see from a bank is that we have to be in step with the modern world, and uh, for the new initiatives which are already in place, for example, UPI was there when many of the people have been writing that banks were missing the UPI in a big way. But I don't think so, right? So it was just that the, the, the situations and the uh, environment was such that UPI became a super hit, right? Because of the digital innovation. But otherwise, it's, it was pretty much there. It was there for long. It was kind of stagnating. But with the demonetization and the COVID hitting, so UPI had a big uh, spurt. Uh, how the model will going to sustain that we have to look how it's going to sustain forward because as of now there's not much in terms of business model out there. Anyway, so uh, coming to the innovation piece that we have some other things which is coming up, for example, CBDC, right? So uh, we were one of the banks who were part of the CBDC, uh, the Central Bank Digital Currency, which has two parts. One is the Central Bank, the wholesale piece, and the other one is the retail piece. The wholesale piece have been implemented in a couple of banks and it's kind of... Uh, just let's see, it's just going on. But the retail piece is something which is really, uh, we have to see uh, how it's going to happen, right? Because as of now, the use case for the retail is basically from a government perspective, right? So if you look at the retail is that, for example, the government gives a direct benefit to the end user. And the end user uses, for example, uh, a farmer, right? If some amount is given to his, his or her account, and that amount is used for something else other than the farming, uh, fertilizers or other other things, whatever is required of farming is uh, being used, right? right? So this retail, the CBDC retail is going to restrict that amount for using only for the farming purposes only. So that's a very good use case and that I think would help India plug in a lot of loopholes. So that is something that we're going to see, but at the same time, uh, because it's a, uh, it's on a uh, DLT, it's a digital ledger technology, mm -hmm. so what's going to happen is that you need to have all the transactions of all the banks along with you, right? So that's the problem. Right. So, uh, right. so you need to have so much of compute and so much of uh, storage uh, within your bank, for example, so say the scale of, say, SBI, right? So you have to keep all the information along with you also because that's a, that's a consensus mode that happens how the DLT works, right? So those are the things that we are looking at from an innovation perspective in bank that we're looking. So basically how we are going to uh, uh, use the core banking in a more efficient way and how we are going to integrate with other fintechs, keeping our things secure, like I mentioned, banks are pillars of trust. So we make, and make sure that uh, nothing goes south, right? So uh, if something, if some of the NBFCs do not, the problem with NBFCs or the fintechs is basically uh, from a regulatory compliance perspective, right? So, <laughs> so that's, that's one of the areas to be cautious about. And secondly is, of course, uh, the data security, right? So ultimately, the whole thing is the data. Security, or everything you take, the ultimate thing is the data. So you have to secure the data. So that is one of the prime important. These two are, the, I think, the key, two key factors uh, which, which define the, the, the uh, NBFCs or the fintechs going forward and their uh, collaboration or integration with the banks. Because at the end of the day, they have to integrate with some, on some of the bank or the other, right? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Sure, Saurav, I think quite meaningful one. In fact, the whole idea of IDBI started with an innovation. 
and now again a remarkable innovation is happening with it going back to the you know private sector yeah. my team perhaps will chase you to get some inputs on that front you know for a news item but thanks for adding that saurav uh, let me move to a foreign bank and shrikant i see a lots of notes that you have so <laughs> so please go ahead and share your experience about the speed of innovation and what's happening at doi sure yeah um so I, i'd like to start off by saying how we're looking at innovation right uh so what we have adopted fundamentally is within the bank we've actually looked at things saying that disruptions can come from business process modifications disruptions can come from technology and both of them affect the end result or outcome so we've gone to a model of operation which fundamentally we call agile at scale and the business teams and the technology teams are actually tied to the hip, at, at the hip uh, between themselves so what we do is anything that we actually do from a technology side or from the business side there's a seat at the table for both sides and what we are trying to do fundamentally is to look at the horizon the horizon in terms of what we're looking in terms of uh, you know breakthrough innovations that come through we talked a lot about chat gpt over the last two sessions as well i mean there are things like that that completely change the landscape not necessarily from a banking standpoint in this case but there are innovations that can actually disrupt our space so what we are saying is work together in terms of both domain and technology sitting side by side The second part is banks need to be very very careful that we don't become the back office of the fintechs. A bank by definition is a fintech now, whichever way you look at it. Okay? And that's where I think the agility of innovations is something that needs to be front and center for every financial institution, bank or otherwise. And and that's that's the way we're looking at it. Incrementally we constantly keep tabs on how we need to upgrade adapt etc to take us to the uh, the future that we actually are going to be living in okay sure noted your points sir uh, shrikant uh, let me come to you amit and take your perspective uh, in terms of innovation and also if you could add to the second part of the question was how do you ensure you know or how do you suggest in terms of updation upgradation of the innovation yeah thanks amol so um basically as an uh, uh, product company we are the enabler of uh, innovation rather than the the guests that you have like who are the user or probably they, they are the idea generators but then as a technology company we should be able to provide some kind of technology hand holding technology background to the organization who want to enable their users to um uh, for the better user, customer, customer experience now that's where um the from 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 the perspective of uh, uh, ex existing organization or the established organization most of the innovation comes from uh, the decision making on the existing data right so if you have a data which is there in your database lying for days and months probably you are already late in innovation so now most of these organizations are moving towards taking a real time decision on the data as the data gets generated and that's where this whole event driven thinking is coming into most of these organizations so if a customer is let's say for from a bank perspective if a customer is buying uh, a particular type of credit card or or uh, offer uh, basically applying for a credit card which is of a platinum platinum or any higher category um, banks probably want to offer him some more cross selling or upselling by giving him additional benefits of life insurance or 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 much more now that decision can only be taken in real time if that information uh, of somebody applying for the credit card is available to the other application which is offering this um, uh, cross selling and that's that is exactly where um, the uh, organization like ours is helping they actually allow you to create these event streams which uh, which can be available to newer applications so if you if you are bringing a new product in the market rather than changing the whole monolithic system of the bank or an organization you can actually just attach it as an uh, this business process as a microservice to the existing uh, okay. uh, uh, existing it infrastructure and then without touching any other um, it ecosystem this can perform their own uh, its own uh, business processes and continue with it 
Okay. Okay. Noted your point, Samit. So let me take one more perspective here on the tech side. We have Ruble also. Ruble, can you go ahead and talk about the innovation and how updation and upgradation also happens? Thanks, Samul. First of all, I would like to start with uh, thanking everyone. And it feels really privileged to be part of such eminent panelists and uh, you know, great audiences there. So I represent a company called uh, Confluent. Uh, many of uh, you wouldn't have heard of Confluent because we are new to India. We just opened our office in India six months back. But I'm sure most of you would have heard of Kafka. So you know anything which is at scale and especially the data which is at scale, uh, Kafka is everywhere You know whenever we talk about data at scale. So Confluent is the creator of Kafka. So founders of Confluent have created Kafka, given it to the open source, and then started Confluent to increase the capabilities of Kafka 10x so that enterprises and especially banks can use it. Right? Now, Amol, you spoke about innovation. And I kind of agree with you know, what uh, Mr. Saurabh said, Amit said, and uh, Mr. Shrikant said. So you know, I guess the value of data is at its highest peak when it is generated. Moment we are even microseconds delayed, the value starts going down, right? So it's important, how do we move from the architectures where data is at rest to data at motion? And that's where, you know, Citibank has applied that uh, along with us, where they have changed their entire data in motion from data at rest to serve their customers, to improve their operations, and at the same time to improve their resilience so that they can be better compliant. So this is one example of innovation which I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Rubal, for that. Shubhrajit, let me come to you. I think post-budget life insurance is the only sector which is into headlines and news. But let's not talk about it. Let's talk yeah, about... I think today we're going to speak about something <laughs> Absolutely. else. Yeah. Absolutely. So we'll speak uh, about the innovation. So please go ahead. Right. I think I have been hearing, listening to that, and some interesting facets of innovations have come out. Uh, we actually debated a lot, and some of the questions that grapples we have always has is that is innovation as a process or a culture? So um, he has spoken about the process, and we debated is it only the process or a culture? Is it should should it decide in a part of the organization as an innovation hub or something, or is it across the organization? We at Edelweiss we had started pretty late in the organization, a pretty new entrance in the life insurance space. At the same time, we are not a digitally born company. So we started with, a, with our own set of traditions and the, the way the life insurance company used to operate. But very early, we moved to a strong product innovation culture. So, so, so the product innovation culture. And three, four years back, we, when we were trying to understand that how do we keep on churning innovation in the products and so on and so forth, and how do you bring it to the organization, the entire organization, we actually tried to understand what is the what is the insight that we are trying to get? And he's absolutely right. Any product that you come out, it takes six months to one and a half years. In some cases, if the product is very complex, it takes one and a half years. And at the earlier six months, because some file and use times and other things are required, to copy that. Then we, we looked at some of the, the underlying, and we found there is strong ingrained culture building in the, the product management department, which basically helps us to do that. Process is in inevitable because you cannot drive a, drive, drive a continuous journey without a process. But the culture, when you looked at, that what is the culture? And is it uh, the agility? Is it the collaboration? So we looked at the organizations are usually go from the culture of anecdotes versus data driven, gut fill versus experimentations. Uh, and one of the most important interesting is that horizontal versus a vertical organization, the organizations are normally vertical. You cannot have innovations, very deep innovations across organization if you have a verticalization. You have already mentioned that, that's it. And the talent pool, is it one size fits all or you should have a special talent budget? Because some of the things we debated and we are in the process of creating some of this in terms of change in the organization culture. I can speak about more, but I think you have multiple other points. So I think for us, the culture is in one key element to drive innovation across organizations. And we are on the journey. Innovation is always a journey. It's a never ending. Sure. I think uh, interesting points, whether innovation is a journey, it's a process, it's a culture. 
but obviously we can't avoid it. Everybody is into it. Uh, in fact, my team often tells me, whenever you moderate a session, why do you have a pad and the pen, and why don't you just use a tab or a you know, phone? You know, that innovation I still not perhaps used to. I still feel comfortable with this. Uh, uh, so obviously, there will be certain parts which will not be innovated, or I do not know uh, how the BFSI companies will look at it. But the important question that I have is, you know, how do you actually measure the innovation? Uh, Anand, you spoke about how you transform kind of end to end, you know, your processes. But the question is, how do you see the end result and how do you measure that innovation? Um, Amol, I am of the opinion that uh, innovations ha happen out of three things. One is the guy has to be absolutely crazy. In uh, five years back, I would have called him mad, but now it's more of craziness than uh, becoming mad. Okay. The uh, other one is where there is a need or there is a pain point okay, in an organization, whether it is operations, whether it is marketing, whether it is customer service, whatever you call for, there is a pain point and there's something you need to change and make it more simpler, more customer friendly, come up with something new. And uh, last but not the least, it's basically the, also the ecosystem, the way it helps. So sometimes, like for example, in case of SBI life in general, the bigger innovation started with SBI pushing us to get into certain kind of collaborations, so you know. Fantastic example. Pravin sir was there as an MD and uh, one of the meetings they said, uh, uh, the chairman said, my daughter w buys something on Amazon in three, three clicks. Can I have a life insurance in three clicks? He said, not possible, absolutely not possible. I said, no, I want you to, to tie it out. And then 16 pages form, the uh, proposal form, which I think you will uh, agree. How do you collapse it into three clicks? And that was the you know, challenge. The crazy mind, uh, the ambition to meet something which is beyond what a normal person can see at that point of time. And then achieve it at the end of the day, which you can measure it. For example, in innovation uh, labs, when we have, when anything innovation is looked at, we looked at certain metrics. Is it going to improve my TAT? Is it going to improve my cost? Is it going to speed up the uh, go-to-market? Is it going to improve my, maybe how, how, how do I calculate it? Maybe my NPS goes up from what it is there today. And uh, one of the most uh, used phrases in today's in India is ease of doing business. Does it make my things easy for my internal customer and external customer because we have internal customers who are various kinds of distributors who are there and external customer is actually the person who buys the policies from you so we have a matrix and once you launch that through that prototype and you look at it you compare what you had looked at earlier because every innovation is backed by technology what what two of my co-panelists said i have not seen a single tech innovation which is not backed by any kind of technology so that's the enabler whether you use a AI or you use a ML, because nowadays we give more importance for machine learning than human learnings, uh, more to artificial intelligence than human intelligence. So obviously these are all enablers which people use to reach that end goal. But have we actually reached what we wanted to reach at the beginning of this particular thing that we thought of it? and whether that particular goal. So these kind of measurements are actually taken into place. And finally, the most important from an organization point of view or from a management point of view is that, um, do I make money out of this? Is there a value for the shareholders? Is there a value for the customers? Is there a value for the employees also? Because they are also major stakeholders. As rightly said, how do you make this process as a culture? And if you have to make it as a culture, we started something called uh, Innovity uh, Month. So every month, once in a month, people used to give us ideas throughout the company. It could be maybe the person who's sitting on the front desk also who's in a position to give right. of how you can do something which will better something what he had. And then we started recognizing those guys, trying to implement that what they said, and the people started accepting innovation as a big thing. So today, anything happening, they immediately put it up into unit and says, this is something I feel is a pain, and this is what I feel we can do. And this team takes it up and then starts along with that person, right. starts building it up. So mm -hmm. measurement is now depending upon what you want to do, where you want to reach, in what time you want to reach, and what is the final value addition you do by reaching that point. I think these three things, according to us, are the measurements of any innovation. Sure. Amazing one. I'm sure uh, the audience must have noted those three parameters. 
because most of the professionals who attend these events look for such insight. So thanks, Anand, for adding that. Sauro, let me come to you, and since you are talking about the technology innovation uh, far more diligently, my question to you is today when most of the fintechs and banks have greater partnerships, in fact, we have a dedicated session for that uh, in the afternoon, but are you believing on your own innovation or uh, building your own innovation or outsourcing the innovation to maybe IT companies, fintech companies, what makes or what works for you? Okay, so uh, innovation, I think, uh, like it, it should be the part of the culture that is uh, very, very important. That is what I feel. And that we are trying to inculcate in the bank as well. Uh, but outsourcing innovation uh, is something that we are quite skeptic about. And uh, uh, we feel that persons who, is, uh, who are inside, the, who are the people of the organization inside, right, they can do a better job in understanding the problems and coming up with the solutions. So outsourcing this uh, thing outside, uh, from an implementation perspective, it's okay. Right? If you have something in your hand and you want to implement it, that's fine. But from, a, from an ideation perspective, from a thought process, from the uh, culture perspective, from an acceptance perspective, uh, from the process also, because every bank has got its own process in getting things done, right? So even if you have certain ideas, it might, might not fly through, right? And then you have the dreaded word of RFP, right? So those things are there. So uh, we have to look into how it works best. And uh, personally, my opinion is to have an internal group or team uh, which will help in uh, driving the innovations in line with the market, in line with the businesses that we do, and uh, understanding the external uh, factors as well, right? So for example, I just want to take one minute here, because uh, uh, people have been talking about AI ML for long, right? So uh, there's again a bit of caution. Everything, I mean, if you have a hammer in your hand, everything appears to be a nail, right? So let's, let's not go that way, right? So uh, if, you, if you put AI, look, so AI has been there for ages now. The earliest literature, if you look at AI, is 1964, right? So AI is the overlying umbrella. Underneath, you have ML, which is machine learning. It's got different ways of how you uh, classify, how do you, uh, there are different ways of, there are different algorithms in doing it. And then you have deep learning, right? So there are three different uh, ways basically, but underlying the machine learning is basically based on the artificial neural networks. So what you have seen is that the, the performance of the uh, compute power and the, uh, the memories have increased over a period of time. And what you're holding in your hand right now is a four CPU or a four, a four core or eight core processor in your hand, which is more powerful than an IBM 316 of 1980s, right? So you're having a whole supercomputer in your hand, right, at the moment. So that is the kind of an advancement that we have done. And from a, a machine learning perspective, what happens is that any artificial neural network, the fundamental concept is that of a perceptron. So the perceptron is built into the, earlier what we had as a GPU, the graphical processor interface. And that is now converted into what is known as the neural engine. So they have just changed the name, so, but basically the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, if you, a bit of a technical term, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. It's an architecture, right? So what happens is that you put a single instruction and you have a set of data. It, appear, it applies to all of that and you get the result. So it can be 2D, 3D, ND, it can go on like that. So that has evolved over a period of time. The densities have evolved. So uh, this is also an evolving area. We have seen what has happened to uh, Chat GPT, right? So Chat GPT is an NLP, it's a natural language processing tool, right? So uh, it's also got an, uh, a picture component for it. But the idea is that use this in a very, very careful way, right? You cannot use it everywhere. So you can see that uh, it generates a lot of false positives and everybody, for example, many people have coming up with solutions that it will find out your attack network breaches and all of that. So that, that, I mean, they scares you. The first thing, anything <laughs> for these technologies, they come in, they try to first scare you, and then they try to get the business, right? So you have to be very careful of when people talk about AIML, you have to understand thoroughly what they are looking at, what they're trying to do, and then take a step forward. Right. Thank you. No, sure, Saurav, I think, uh, thanks for adding that chat GPT, which everyone is trying to use. So. Uh, Recently, Mr. Nadella was in town and he actually showcased how chat GPT works, you know, at the Microsoft conference and he actually made Wadapao talk to Pao Bhaji, 
you know, in the conversation. And he actually asked a ch question to chat GPT, which are the top 10 uh, or top 3 Vada Pao stalls in Mumbai. Now, the I born and brought up in Mumbai or lots of my friends, which generally goes to eat Vada Pao, those Vada Pao stalls were not there in that list. Yeah, so all those things. For example, the, <laughs> yes. the one example, the latest one which came yesterday, I think, was that, uh, how do you find out, so my brother's age is less than half and then <laughs> what would be at, at you know, 35? Yes. That's a complete wrong answer, right? <laughs> so at least you can be sure that AIML is going to be there for some time before yes. it actually matures. Yeah, so we should use our intelligence, human intelligence, more than the artificial intelligence. Great, thanks, uh, Saurav, for adding that. Let me move to Amit. Uh, since we are using platforms very aggressively to manage the innovation and to manage the speed of innovation, how do you see the... Um, uh, the potential contribution of platforms going ahead in the BFSI space, specifically to maintain the speed of innovation. Yeah, sure. So uh, basically, um, um, I, I would probably say that it is it has been forced on us as an as a generation because the next generation is impatient. So we all know um, if you talk to any millennial, millennial a kid like which was born after 2000, he will consider us as in like fossils. Because, I mean, seriously, we, they, banking, they, they haven't seen the branches. They, they only talk, talk about online account opening, online transactions, everything online. Now, from, and because they become the customers, every organization has an impatient customer now. So they cannot live with status quo. And that's where this whole platform has been kind of becoming very popular. Organizations are forced to uh, reduce their time to market for any product they're launching. And they do not have time to uh, deploy a product, test an environment, this environment, move it to production, test it there. There's absolutely no time. They want everything to be available so that they can actually use no-code, low-code kind of technology and uh, do a faster time to uh, market. And that's exactly what is forcing um, uh, these organizations, or in fact, all the banking organizations are moving away from uh, monolith deployment to the platforms. Thanks for, uh, thanks for adding that, Amit, and uh, uh, describing the difference between the generations. So let me move to uh, Shrikant and you know, learn more about maybe the mistakes that in the innovation. So it's, it's uh, uh, I mean, most of the bankers and everyone is today aggressively saying that we do not need checkbook, we do not need, we are not visiting branches, but uh, I see that we need checkbooks for a cancel check. <laughs> <laughs> and you know every every year we are ordering a checkbook for a cancel check right for a, for most of the times you have to prove that you have a bank account maybe that's the reason so what i would like you to tell us is what are the mistakes generally happens while adopting innovations and i'm sure the global banks generally are very very aggressive in adopting innovations so you may have some case studies there sure sure so so i think there was a question a little earlier um, in terms of basically talking about you know, what sort of innovation makes sense, what sort of innovation doesn't make sense. And also there was a discussion around saying, is it universal innovation capability within the organization or specific groups that actually do innovation? I strongly, what we've basically done is we've said we need both top-down and bottom-up innovation. Okay, so what, one of the big things that people do is, if you start putting ground rules around innovation, your brain freezes. Okay. Honestly speaking, innovation is the capability and the elbow room to be creative and the elbow room fundamentally to be able to experiment. This is where the biggest mistakes in innovation come from. First, start with random ideas, you know, blue sky thinking. Then start to narrow down in terms of saying, what are those viable innovations that come out of that, you know, engine that you create? I think this is the biggest mistake a lot of organizations make. Put, put rules around it, people will stop doing, making innovations. They'll just run away from it. The second thing is, um, basically, um, a lot of things, you don't think that you're the first person coming up with the idea. The openness to looking at the ecosystem to be able to develop on it is very important. We need to work with startups. We need to work with fintechs. We need to work with organizations completely in the technology space. I think we need to start looking at those kind of inputs to come in 
to create the environment for creativity. I think that's very, very important for us internally. And last but not the least, please don't beat up on failed innovations. The most important things, I mean, if you look at the Bay Area, a lot of people will have badges that they carry which says, I had three failed startups. You know, that is the most important thing that we need to look at and make sure that you actually have a category of awards saying, I did these three things, I failed, but you know what, this is what I learned. I think, to me, those are the important things that need to, you know, we need to look at. But to answer your question, what are failed innovations, why, you talked about checks, right? I mean, you need to have curation, but the curation shouldn't be the first step. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Sure, sure, Shikant. Uh, uh, Subrajit, in terms of innovation specifically in the life insurance segment now, uh, because it's, it's a little complicated because you have to explain the insurance, you have to explain the investments, you have to explain the risks. So what are the major innovations that's happening in your space right now? And you know, how do you see that spanning over maybe next three, four years? Before that, with low code and no code, now chat GPT code also. So developers be <laughs> ready with that. Because I think uh, routine codes can be written at chat GPT if you, and uh, it's pretty easy to do that. Two part on the chat GPT before, because it's a pretty prominent discussion. So one, chat GPT is not a predictive engine. It's NLP, so it's information based. I think decision making, there are two parts. One based on a history, information, which is, either black and white, there is no gray on that. Information, if you obtain correctly, triangulate and so on and so forth. And chat GPT have been able to do to that extent, it knows the information. But the critical part is that while the ML and AI, and I'm talking about ML only, let's do, it's a probabilistic outcome. When the outcome is probabilistic, there will be false positives. So it, it cannot be 100% right. Unfortunately, we take the outcome as a binary. 80% probability means it's gonna happen. No, it's not gonna happen. There are 20 purchase chance that it will not happen. And that awareness is a part of the culture building and innovation. I will tell you why it is innovation, because most of our decision making in the digital world is going to be a probabilistic one. And organization needs to move their culture to the probabilistic, understanding of the probabilistic decision making. So coming to a point that insurance is a complex set of products and how do we explain, I think three things we look at. I think one, the very critical part, as ours is inside gathering. Great insight you have given. If I, if I am a banker sitting with you now, I'll take that insight as a problem statement that why do I require a checkbook? Why should I have to have a cancelled checkbook? Our job is to find an insight. Why you do innovate? Because we are trying to solve a problem which we may or may not know. Some of the problems are latent, deep-rooted, embedded. We need to bring them out. And that's where some of our great insight gathering works in terms of not typically a customer research, but currently there is a lot of other approach like ethnography, observing people, see what they are behaving, how they do that. So inside gathering is a great part of an innovation process for us. And that's where I think we have come. With that, next you come up with your customer proposition based on the inside gathering, where, where not only the, your intelligence that you gather through your um, um, observation will come into play, you also apply behavioral economics in your design thinking approach. So, uh, my previous speaker was talking about what next. If you see the what next, some of the initial design of the hypothesis of the what next might have come from some of the behavioral economics understanding of that. So, you position your position in such a fashion that you are able to predict that and then of course validate that you are testing with your ML learning. We are currently have just launched a digital advisory product for a customer need analysis product. There are so far been a lot of uh, hub baked, a uh, little bit of robo advisory, some manual advisory. We have tried to create an end to end digital advisory which will help our seller to explain the nuances of the product in the best way they would like to that. It will lead to a level of personalization where I can actually understand their customer context and share the advice. Uh, what is the natural? Aap ye lo. This is a good product. Take this product, pay me two lakhs of rupees and get this product and this is the way the normal sales have a product led. What you want to do is a need led while understanding the contextualization. This is in our journey of personalization and innovation. I think this is the step we are trying to create. Of course, I don't have much time to explain but otherwise 
it's a, it's a very interesting product to do that. Sure, sure. So, Rubal, let me come back to you now and, you know, uh, learn specifically on the data part because majority of the innovation is based on the data. So, give us some sense there in terms of how do you see the usage of data technology shaping up the future of BFSI and more importantly, the challenge I see uh, most of the BFSI companies find is how accurate is the data. In fact, Gupta sir also kind of touched that topic about the data. So, how do you ensure that the data is accurate, safe and, you know, it's been used by the BFSI companies that they want to? Thanks, Amol. I guess, great question. So, as I said, in the previous question, you know, the need of the R is to move to event-driven systems. Moment we are moving towards event-driven system, data cannot be static. It has to continuously flow. Now it depends on the application usage, whether the application has to use the data in the real time or maybe as a stream after a week or an hour, etc. Now if we talk about compliance, today you know, whether we are talking about compliance or security, the data is getting accumulated from various sources. Then we are running our rules and algorithms on top of it and figuring out whether there is a risk or not. But, you know, by the time we are already late and we are giving time to, you know, bad actors to seep in. And on the contrary, now the need is how can we collecting the data in the real time, flowing it so that it is not static and you know, all the related applications can immediately act on it. So that's one case on, you know, either fraud detection or compliance or on security. So these are three things which are going on there. Second is, gone are the days where software is lying, you know, or is just one department kind of a, a, you know, piece. Today the need is that all the softwares and all the applications have to work together in conjunction and helping the business to grow immediately, <coughs> improve their time to market, and at the same time, bring the operational efficiency. Now, in order to do that, we have to envisage, you know, data as the central nervous system of the organization or of the bank. Now, if we have to imagine it as a central nervous system, it has to continuously flow and help all the parts of the bank with the data whenever they need. It is flowing, right? If you need more, you can take it, right? So that's how we have to envisage it. And that's how, you know, Confluent is also working towards it. Now, the data is accurate because we are collecting it from various sources and flowing it. So there is no, you know, there is no point of deduplication and, you know, false positives and all of those things because it is continuously in motion, right? So I want to give an example of, uh, you know, what JP Morgan did. So they, they had a lot of challenge around, uh, especially their SIEM. Right. So what they did is they put Confluent at the back end, uh, uh, you know, at the front end before it was going into the SIEM, the data was going into SIEM and they could filter it out and could improve their posture, you know, by 48 percent. And, and that's, a, that's a very good use case where we can talk about, you know, how banks can be ahead of the bad actors and protect the bank and at the same time provide, a, you know, a great customer service. So, sure, so sure, noted your points, Rubel. I'd, so I'd like to just add one yeah. more point. Yes, because so, so this is very, very important, right? Reference data being streamlined across your enterprise. Uh, biggest thing is like, for example, you've got counterparty data, you've got product data, you've got investment data, so on and so forth. Now, all of these systems in general, I mean, in most places I've seen, they all have different systems using different lookups. This is where I think our biggest crime detection actually can happen in terms of if the data is consistent across the board, you know, you can actually track, you know, bad investments, bad, uh, uh, you know, players in the system, so on and so forth very, very easily. Reference data unification is supremely important and I'm glad you touched upon it. Sure, sure. So we still have two to three minutes and I will take one question from the audience. Uh, can so anyone has any question? Yes, please go ahead. Can we have a mic there in the second row? Uh, yes, the mic is coming. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, first of all, uh, to the uh, panelists for giving such an uh, insightful session here. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, to most of the panelists, is that uh, now, uh, even as Sarva saying that, Srikanth Sarva was saying that data is sitting in so many different applications, so many distributed uh, databases, how the organizations are identifying 
the solution to bring build the golden source of data within the organization because the volume of the data is day by day increasing and there are concepts like data fabric and data mesh and all are those being uh, identified as a solution uh, uh, for building those golden source of data sure sure uh, where are you from i know uh, i have been working in jp morgan earlier uh, but okay. uh, now i have given my own okay you had given some example to rubal by uh, no no <laughs> but thanks rubal for sharing that <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, sure uh, yeah. Shrikant, do you want to take that question? I can take it. Sure. So, so one of the things that we are actually looking at is uh, creating an internal data marketplace. So everything is API. It has to be API driven in terms of primarily saying don't duplicate data. So we're trying to create a registry of all of the data objects. And we've got, for APIs, we've got all the registries all over the place. Technology solutions offer that. We need a similar thing for the data marketplace. And if we can actually feed off of the same data sources, that's the kind of strategy that we're going forward with. We don't have it, but that's the direction we're headed in. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Saro, you also want to quickly add to that? No, that's exactly the, the, the way forward, basically, that we have data sitting in silos, right? And that, that's the major problem. Different systems accessing different uh, uh, application, different way. And then uh, you, you don't get a unified answer, for example, for the enterprise fraud risk management systems right so other other marketing tools right so they have different data points sitting every, across so uh, the enterprise uh, data warehouse right or data mesh in in the for example both having the data in at rest and data in motion coming in together so that and of course it has to be api driven with complete uh, uh, security encryptions on both sides so that would definitely help going forward that is still work in uh, progress and most of the uh, organizations are doing it Sure. Thank you, uh, Saurabh, for adding that. And thank you so much, my dear panelists, for sharing remarkable insights here. I hope all of you enjoyed the insights. I wish I could have taken more questions uh, from you. And also, I had a couple of more questions, but the time is limited. There is always a challenge for us, you know, whether to put it 45 minutes, 50 minutes, because, you know, sometimes it should not also be too large and, you know, too boring for you. So, uh, but I, I, I really enjoyed listening to all of you. So thank you so much for sharing those meaningful insights. And thank you so much for listening to us very patiently. Uh, phrase back to you.